Welcome to part 2B of the series of slideshows about microfossils. As this chart indicates, we are approaching the end of the series about microfossils. This show reviews the scientific discipline called palynology. Palynology and its concerns, spores and pollen, are defined on this slide. In addition to the study of the reproductive strategies of existing plants, the discipline includes the categorization of spores and pollen in sedimentary rocks. This paleopalynology exists because both spores and pollen have a tough, acid-resistant outer coatings. The exin, a refractory organic compound of carboxylic fatty acids called sporopollenin. As a fossil, the exenes retain to a large degree the form and markings of the original grain. Exenes of spores are abundant in nearly all fine-grained sedimentary rocks from Silurian times onward, and their changes over time are a prime source of biostratigraphic data. As shown on this slide, almost all can be classed as monolith or tridity, that is, to exhibit either a single or a three-pronged Y-shaped scar, depending on their mode of attachment before dispersal. Most spores are produced by the lower plants, the cryptogams. Listed on this slide, they lack both the specialized fibrous conducting tubes for a liquid and the true roots of the higher plants, and are alike only in that spores can perform their fertilizing function only in water. So all of them function best in water or in damp, shady environments. The two main groups are the thallophytes, fungi and algae, and the bryophytes, mosses, liverworts, and hornworts. Lichens, a commensal pairing of a fungus and an alga, are included. Ferns, too, reproduce by spores, but they do have fibrous vascular tissue that forms tubes, xylem, to carry water from the roots and less woody phloem to feed starch from the leaves to the rest of the plant. These photos of monolith and tridate spores and fossils from New Zealand give some idea of the wide range of shape and ornamentation found in spores. The higher plants constitute two major groups, gymnosperms and angiosperms. The older one, the gymnosperms, appeared late in Devonian times as ferns with seeds. But as shown on this chart, they were preceded in the fossil record by three still extant types of vascular spore-bearing plants. Some of their ancestors, like the scale trees and cornates, grew tall in Carboniferous times. As indicated, seed ferns became extinct during the Jurassic period, but the other gymnosperms, their seeds lacking the protection of an ovary, became numerous and well diversified during the Carboniferous period. Ever since, although now overshadowed by the more diversified angiosperm, gymnosperms have been a major element among terrestrial plants. On this chart are text and pictures of the most striking of the characteristics that identify the eight groups of gymnosperms. Today, they are predominantly conifers. The pines, firs, spruce, sequoia, cycads, yew, cedars, cypress, and junipers. A federal and ginkgo are distinct, for their pollen is not formed and housed in woody protective cones, but is exposed in clusters, also called cones. 
The conifers depend on wind to scatter their pollen, and gymnosperms in general do not have animal aids to pollination. However, the pollen of some cycads is carried from male to female by beetles. This slide pictures a few of the pollen grains of existing gymnosperms. Note that most are monosulcate, that is, have only one elongate aperture where the exene is reduced in thickness. And here are some fossil conifer bisacates, pollen with lateral lobes from New Zealand. For paleopalynologists, the gymnosperms are invaluable because their pollen is abundant in late Paleozoic and all Mesozoic strata laid down by water or wind, whereas that of the angiosperms is found in large quantities only in Cretaceous and younger formations. The oldest angiosperm pollen with a single elongate aperture called a colpus or a sulcus, soon became more diversified than its cognate in form and in the number and type of apertures because of the rapid expansion of flowering plants into a variety of environments and lifestyles inaccessible to gymnosperms. This diversification is evident in the multiplicity of pollen configurations, although some patterns of their apertures, ornamentation, and shape are more common than others. Monocotyledons, plants with only one seed leaf, produce pollen with but one aperture. These grains are called monocolpate or monosulcate. Most dicotyledons are eudicots. Their pollen has three elongate apertures and none or several rounded smaller openings in or around the colpi called pores. For palynologists, they are tricolpate or trisulcate and with pores, tricolporate. Today, eudicots make up about 75% of all the species of angiosperms, so their exines are common fossils. Among the exceptions, others with no apertures at all, called inaperturate, and others with one or more pores and no copy. In palynological terminology, these are mono, di, or triporate, but they are but three of several hundred terms coined to describe the large range of discrete combinations of form, ornament, and aperture found in both current and fossil exons. The success of angiosperms is due in large part to their use of flying insects. Bees, wasps, moths, flies, and butterflies who transport their pollen to the stigma. Others entice beetles, and a few have adopted themselves to the surfaces of fruit bats and several species of birds, including hummingbirds. Now, only some 10% of the angiosperms use the wind as a conveyance of their pollen grain. To work with spores and pollen requires either a conventional microscope with a 100 power oil immersion lens or a scanning electron device capable of much higher magnification. But the extraction from rock of fossil spores and pollen involves a series of treatments, starting with the use of mechanical force to crush the sample followed by soaking and washing to break the rock into particles less than five millimeters in diameter. Then hydrochloric and hydrofluoric acids remove carbonates and silica. Sometimes a heavy liquid flotation ensures separation of organic matter from any remaining mineral and stain makes the floated material more visible. Once freed, under a microscope, the exenes are segregated by category 
and either mounted on glass slides for identification or imaged by a scanning electron microscope. Coming next, diatoms and radiolaria. <laughs>